Morena Koto, ko George Hobson Toko Ingoa. My name is George Hobson. As Hamish said, I'm a 17 year old environmentalist, um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you all this morning um, in the Wellington Hub, but also with you all online and in the different regions across Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, can I start by saying I'm thrilled to be a part of this inspiring Kopapa? I think it's amazing what we're doing today. And it's incredible this new conference format as well. It's been amazing to see the different presenters come on via our screen here in Wellington. Um, I'd like to start again by acknowledging the amazing speaker just before me. And I think what I'm going to say, a lot of it will tie into what was said there as well. So I think those connections are really valuable. Um, and by thanking the Wellington team here for inviting me to be our keynote speaker for the region. Really appreciate it. So. Who am I? Well, my name's George. I'm really passionate about protecting the environment. Um, I first became an interested in environment, environmental protection when I was about 10 years old. I had the opportunity to look after a friend's pair of cockatiels or small parrots, and when I had to give them back, it was obviously absolutely devastating for a 10-year-old um, because I'd spent seven weeks bonding with these amazing birds. So. Naturally, I spent many hours over the next weeks and potentially months looking for that one piece of information that would convince my parents to let me get a pair myself. Uh, suffice to say, I was not successful in that, but it did, I, I did start to research those, those sorts of birds and I started off with cockatiels and then branched off into other pet parrots that I could potentially convince my parents to let me get instead. And then I ended up on Australian birds, researching different parrots found in the wild, and eventually I found myself coming across New Zealand birds. And basically, ever since then, I've stuck with those as my primary interest, because really what's not to love about massive rainbow pigeons and crazy birds living on the forest floor that are flightless in the form of kiwi with crazy vestigial wings, and we've got an amazing range of biodiversity here in Aotearoa that's absolutely inspiring. And yeah, is what drives me to do what I do to this day. Over the last seven years, I've spent time on many different conservation projects, but some of my highlights have been working as one of the first Zealandia Youth Ambassadors um, in Zealandia Eco Sanctuary in Wellington. I worked extensively on their education program with the team there, both in the sanctuary with school groups and visiting schools in the Wellington region. Um, I've worked on offshore islands with the Department of Conservation, protecting and preserving endangered and threatened species, sometimes even critically endangered, um, from places like Kapiti Island to Motutapu Island and even on Machi Soames here in Wellington. I've worked as the campaigns coordinator of Forest and Bird Youth recently, which is where I've been spending time meeting with MPs and trying to lobby them to consider nature and their environmental policies and recognise how important nature is, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I've represented youth interests on a reference group to the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy to ensure that our interests are entrenched in this new document, and I'm on the Wellington City Council Environmental Reference Group. I'm incredibly passionate about protecting the environment, which might come across, and I'm especially committed to ensuring that youth have a seat at the table for important environmental decisions and are represented in those decisions because what comes out of those is going to be affecting our generation the most compared with any other. The theme of my talk today is conservation, nature, environment and a COVID rethink. So I'm going to start now by just introducing some of the key themes I'll touch on. Um, I guess the first is why youth voice matters in conservation projects and that's something I'm particularly passionate and committed to. Um, I'll then move on to the importance of incorporating nature into our everyday life and how we can work together to ensure that happens and to make that happen in the most meaningful way possible. And I'll finish up by talking a little bit about how COVID-19 has provided us an opportunity to rethink our priorities, especially regarding how we can connect with and restore and protect nature. Aiming to talk for around 20 minutes um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end so I'd love to hear your curliest questions possible. Um, we've got people in Wellington who can use our microphone and use the app if you're anywhere else that would be wonderful. So I'll start with the first point and that's around the importance of youth voice and conservation projects. I'd like to start by taking a step back. Nature. Why is it important? Well, one has to first and foremost recognise the incredible intrinsic value that nature brings with it, the amazing biodiversity we have here in Aotearoa. It's worth protecting in and of itself. But just looking at how it relates to people, it sustains us. A healthy environment is central 
to a healthy society. For example, at a fundamental level, it provides us with fresh water, clean air, even electricity, recreational opportunities. It's the backbone of New Zealand. Therefore, for a healthy country, we need healthy nature. And it's crucial we protect and restore the environment, not only in urban or not only in wilderness areas on Department of Conservation land, but also in cities and in regions across New Zealand. It's got to be everywhere. And from my experience, a huge amount of this protection comes from community groups who are passionate about protecting nature in their local area. And their work is amazing, and they deserve to be supported. In fact, their work is crucial because they do things like backyard trapping, planting, um, engaging the community in environmental matters, and even lobbying to some extent, um, beach cleanups, etc. And all are making an incredible difference to conservation in New Zealand. But something I have noticed through my involvement in those sorts of organisations is that predominantly the membership often um, contains well people of a slightly older demographic. Um, and that might be because retirees have more time on their hands and that sort of thing. Um, and retirees do an amazing job. In fact, so many of our conservation successes are solely thanks to them. But the model of only older people being involved in those organisations which care for nature is often unsustainable. In fact, I've seen some organisations fall over because of it in my time. Um, and protecting the environment should be in everyone's best interest because Ultimately, the environment, if we can protect that, it's central to the health of not only New Zealanders, but people across the entire world, um, which I hear we have some people internationally in this conference as well. Um, so what's the solution? Well, from my experience, young people can bring an incredible enthusiasm, passion, and even knowledge to community groups when they're engaged with and supported to be involved in them. I think. Even beyond that as well, young people, when we're supported, can have influence in larger organisations and, as we've seen from things like the School Strike for Climate, can initiate movements that ultimately change the way Aotearoa looks. I guess often young people bring ideas that are innovative because we haven't had years in a career that has taught us what right and wrong looks like. So many times young people can approach projects and problems with a clean slate and bring a new innovative ideas that haven't been, well, historically proven to be wrong and not the right way of approaching something. But oftentimes, these sorts of conservation organisations and conservation work can prove somewhat daunting to young people in the sense that it's often a whole bunch of experts who know everything on the topic and walking in as someone who hasn't had time or the, ex ch the chance or the experience to connect with nature and understand it can be quite scary. I've had that experience myself. Um, it's usually at this point when I'm talking to a group of community conservation organisation coordinators that I would implore you to take drastic action to engage young people in your conservation projects. But I guess we've got a bit of a different audience here. So what I think instead, the, the way we together collectively can make the most difference is by fundamentally rethinking the environment our children are growing up in. And that's not to say I don't, I don't suggest you should still actively encourage your students to get out and be involved in conservation projects. That's amazing. But with the collective networks we've got here with teachers, with environmental educators, there's an amazing opportunity to change the environment our children are growing up in. And that's a segue into my next point, which is around nature experience and why that's so important in young people. Um, and the relationship between time spent in the environment and environmental action more generally. And I want to start this again by taking a step back. My relationship with nature started way back at 10 years old with those pair of cockatiels that I disappointingly had to give away after seven weeks. But since then, the more time I spend in admiration of and actually just in nature, whether that be on whale watching trips or bush walks or coastal walks, all sorts of things, even swimming in rivers with fuel, the more committed I personally become to protecting it because I'm building that relationship. And that's the case with so many people I meet as well. The more time spent in nature, the more opportunity to connect with nature, but also the more oblig obliged people feel to actually do something to protect it. I've also met people who have only had their environmental awakening per se in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s or 70s 
and wish it had come sooner, but they weren't offered the opportunity to actually get out and experience the environment. And I think we have an opportunity right now to really rethink the way that we do education in the classroom, or more to the point, out of the classroom. As teachers and educators, so many of you will massively shape the youth of a great number of New Zealanders. I think if young people are supported to build a relationship with nature in their childhood and in their youth, that in my experience, it will actually lead to a better understanding of nature, but also a sense of wanting to do something to protect it because we understand it and we have a relationship with it. Um, and having the opportunity to connect with nature may even lead to people wanting to be more engaged in conservation organisations, initiating movements, being involved in larger companies, that sort of thing, with the purpose of protecting nature, because we understand it, we want to protect it. I think it's also true that many young people will carry this sort of relationship with them throughout their whole life, into the work they do in their adulthood. I'm just imagining a generation of engineers who really care about protecting nature, or architects, mathematicians, physicians, even real estate. It's in, it provides an amazing opportunity to fundamentally change society and what it looks like. It even has the chance, if we do it right, to make a paradigm shift happen in the way we look at nature. And I think we can make it happen by revamping the education system to not only teach about the environment in the context of tigers or the Amazon forest, but actually take nature and incorporate it into everyday learning. So, how? Well, in my role as campaigns coordinator of Forest and Bird Youth, I've worked with my colleague Michael Burton-Smith in investigating what the science says about this sort of thing. And what we've found is really interesting. So, the key point that we've discovered is that the extinction of experience is a crucial issue. So, fewer and fewer people have daily contact with nature, especially our younger generations. And between 1997 to 2003, the number of children participating in outdoor activities daily fell, um, as did the average time spent outdoors, and that's a continuing trend. And something really interesting we saw was a study was undertaken on students learning about the water cycle. And these students were fully competent at recic reciting the way the water cycle works in theory. They understood how water flowed through places, how life lives in streams, that sort of thing. They were fully competent, but when they were asked which way does water flow in a stream, nearly half of them said up, because they hadn't gone out, they hadn't experienced a stream in real life. They didn't know. They just assumed, well, it either goes down or up, we'll go up. They, they hadn't seen it. They hadn't gone out and actually experienced that stream in real life. Um, and seen, well, obviously, that water flows downhill in streams. And I'm somewhat of a bird watcher myself, and something else we saw was that when teaching kids about bird watching, I, if I would approach it, I would say, well, let's get some binoculars, let's get a guide of all the birds nearby, let's go out for a bush walk, and we'll walk silently and we'll look at some birds. But actually, what these people did in the article we found was that they approached it completely differently. They organised a workshop where kids were able to create their own wings that they put on their backs and they'd design those wings however they want, and then once that's finished, they'd go out for a walk into the bush, and they'd start spotting birds and go, whoa, that one looks like me. They'd find that kind of similarity and connection between us and nature, and that would lead to a further desire to understand and identify those birds, understand what they were, how they operated, how those wings worked. But it all started because they made that connection with nature by actually going outdoors with something they'd already developed. Um, and it was really interesting. And I think overall the basic principle that I'm saying is we need to incorporate environmental experiences into everyday learning throughout our education system. And I'm fairly confident we're all on a pretty similar page with this, so I have two specific ideas to share with you today. Firstly, green infrastructure in schools. That can look like compost bins, community gardens, worm farms, uh, planting, rat trapping, all sorts of things like that. And I think, I, I've even visited a school that had a lizard garden that was being established and the kids were super into it because they were starting to see skinks come back to their property and being able to experience nature that way. Um, and the key that I've seen from projects like this is that students are able to be responsible for the operation of them. So for example, 
when I was working with the Zealandia education team here in Wellington, we went out to schools on outreach programs and we'd work with the students to set up trapping projects and we'd give them the traps and we'd leave them with them and the tracking tunnels and everything they needed and we'd go over the safety maybe three or four times to make sure they wouldn't catch their fingers in the traps. And then we'd work with teachers to establish rosters for those kids to actually go by themselves with full understanding of what the trap does and how it works. Go in a collective of maybe by themselves two, three or four people on a roster and check the traps and clear the traps and have responsibility for them. And not only does that let those children develop leadership opportunities and develop those skills that way, but it also allows them to actually engage in a project that really makes a difference to nature and get that experience at a young age. And everyone was really into it. All the kids I've worked with when it comes to trapping were really, really keen to get involved. And additionally, with this sort of green infrastructure in place, schools can actually become really valuable community assets. So if we've got those compost bins and those community gardens, schools can become a community asset that the community can take ownership of and that the kids can be involved in even during weekends or school holidays if it's set up right. And I think when kids are involved in a project like that, that they can still tend to over the school holidays and they feel a responsibility to do so, that embeds in them the idea that Experiencing nature isn't just something that happens from 9am to 3pm Monday through Friday. It's actually something that's part of everyday life. And that's really valuable. Second idea, continued professional development for teachers. So obviously a huge number of our teachers in Aotearoa are amazing and overworked constantly. So it's unfair in many cases to just say, all right, we think this is a good idea. Let, give it to you and do it, crack on with it. It's often not going to work so well because of that massive strain on so many teachers. So what I think would be very valuable is to start building those relationships between local environmental educators and local teachers to help produce those programs that work both to engage kids but also to actually make a difference to the environment. And that way no, one, no single person is getting the brunt of these sorts of projects, um, people can work collaboratively to share skills and share ideas and make amazing projects that allow children to start developing that relationship with nature at a young age. And I know I said two ideas, but I'm going to introduce a third really quickly. Nature isn't just at your local zoo or at your local sanctuary or in a nearby piece of dock land. It's not. Nature is everywhere, and environmental education does not have to and should not have to centre around getting on a bus and driving for an hour to Zealandia or to Auckland Zoo or places like that. And also, many lower decile schools can't afford that in the first place. Getting students out of the classroom can literally be as simple as going and putting out the compost, going and tending to the community garden, checking the traps, planting some trees on your school property, building your lizard garden, for example. Um, and by suggesting nature is just at Zealandia, or just at the zoo, or just at the dockland, it's giving students the wrong idea that nature is here, and by planting a tree in your own backyard, it's not really gonna do much. Whereas actually, nature is everywhere, and planting a tree in your own backyard should be encouraged to have as much environmental impact as working with places like the zoo and supporting those other conservation programs. Because if we can establish nature connection in everyday life and ensure people are engaged in projects which protect nature throughout all parts of their community, it sends a much better message than just the land or just nature is here and everyone else is over here. And even if this all fails and every student doesn't suddenly grow up to become this radical environmentalist who spends every waking moment composting and, I don't know, growing hemp in their backyards, it's not worthless, I promise. It's not a waste of time. Because spending time in nature actually has proven to have immense well-being benefits alongside that connection with nature and that environmental protection aspect. Research conducted by Dr. Danielle Shanahan of the Centre for People and Nature makes it clear that benefits to outdoor education are not solely better appreciation of the natural world or young people engaging in more conservation projects, but actually, young people who spend time in nature show considerably less symptoms of depression, anxiety and stress. And this is crucial now almost more than ever before. And just reference the Youth 12 overview, which 
surveyed mental health of secondary school students in 2012 and found that 38% of female students and 23% of male students had experienced feeling down or depressed for most of the day for at least two weeks in a row in the year. Most of the day for at least two weeks in a row. And additionally, research shows that young people can actually learn better if they're in an environmental environment or connected with nature. So if you're in a classroom and you can look out your window and see trees and bush and birds, you're going to learn better than if you're sitting in your classroom and you look outside and all you can see is another concrete building. I'm going to spend my last few minutes, because I think I'm coming to the, uh, nearly to the end of my time, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the opportunity and the impact that COVID-19 has and has had, and primarily kind of the opportunities that it brings with it in terms of rethinking some of our priorities. Um, COVID-19 is unquestionably a terrible thing for New Zealand and for the world, and the un economic and health implications are awful, and I'm not trying to glamorise that at all, but it did allow us, during lockdown, many of us, to take stock and rethink about what kind of really matters to us in our everyday life. And some of the key things that I noticed was we, we started seeing more birds in CBD areas. For example, in Wellington, keredu started popping up next to the beehive and a falcon arrived and hung out on Lambton Quay for a lot of the time. Um, lots of us tried gardening. We walked and cycled in our local community without fear of getting hit by a car. And our air pollution levels massively dropped in so many CBD areas. Um, and most importantly, we collectively baked an extraordinarily concerning amount of sourdough. Um, and now we're back to normal life, and air pollution has skyrocketed in CBD areas again. I'm scared to cycle through town because of reckless drivers. Uh, walking has vaguely gone out of fashion. Our local parks are nowhere near as populated as they were during lockdown. And, fly-by-night yeast enthusiasts have suddenly disappeared as quickly as they arrived. The theme of today's conference is Manaki Whenua, Manaki Tangata, Haere Whakamua. Care for the land, care for the people, go forward. By reflecting on the unique situation that COVID-19 has put us in, I think it's clear that the status quo is pretty unsustainable. Because those birds that everyone saw during lockdown have all disappeared again. We don't have a falcon on Lambton Quay. Kerudu have disappeared from the city. Um, and that's because the environment has returned again to a situation and a status that's almost untenable for native species to live in our CBD areas and our cities. And I think it's really important we use this chance now to permanently rethink how we want our country to look moving forward. And personally, I want a future where the climate crisis is ancient history where the economy prioritises a healthy environment over short-term monetary gain, and where the citizens of Aotearoa New Zealand feel fully connected to and with nature across our country, and also have a, fe a fearless sense of duty to care for it. I'm going to leave you with this to ponder before I finish up. How can we, as educators, ensure that our environmental programs include diverse ways of connecting with nature to ensure that as many people as possible, young people, are excited about getting out into nature and about New Zealand's native species? I think it's really important that we can encourage as many people as possible, especially young people, to get excited about getting outdoors into our environment, building that connection with nature, and going and experiencing what incredible biodiversity, new, biodiversity there is in New Zealand. Nā mihi nui, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you.